The National Famine Museum at Strokestown Park and Irish Heritage Trust are screening this film as part of the Great Famine Voices Roadshow 2020 online event series. The Great Famine Voices Roadshow is funded by the Government of Ireland Emigrant Support Programme. Liverpool in the 19th century was a great port of the British Empire. It had been a centre of the slave trade and was now the centre of the tobacco, cotton and sugar trades with several miles of docks and trading links to every corner of the earth. The docks were, in the words of one observer, as wondrous as the pyramids of Egypt. It was a merchant city of great wealth alongside extreme poverty. Liverpool was the leading departure port for North America and also had regular traffic to and from Ireland. So when the Irish potato crop failed in 1845 and 1846, many thousands of Ireland's poorest rural inhabitants began leaving their homes. And for most, Liverpool was to be their destination. Government kept no record of the numbers of migrants. However, as early as December 1846, the Liverpool magistrate, Edward Rushton, arranged a count informing the Home Secretary that between the 13th day of January and the 13th day of December 1847, 296,231 persons landed in this port from Ireland. That of this vast number, almost 130,000 emigrated to the United States, that some 50,000 were passengers on business, and that the remainder were paupers, half naked and starving, landed for the most part during the winter and becoming, immediately on landing, applicants for parochial relief. In 1847, of course, the famine is um, becoming increasingly um, devastating for uh, the people of Ireland, the people of rural Ireland in particular, and especially that class of landless agricultural labourers who comprised a lot of the Strokestown estate the lowest rung in the social ladder, people who had survived with only a potato patch to, uh, to, 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 to sustain a whole family for many years. Once the potato crop failed, these people became increasingly destitute, couldn't pay the rents that they had uh, previously paid to the landlord. And so Dennis Mahan, the landlord, decided the cheapest way to get rid of them was to help them emigrate to North America. The Irish Heritage Trust, based at the National Famine Museum in County Roscommon, has traced the journey of a group of migrants from Strokestown. Yes, I suppose one of the most important periods of history for this house, for Strokestown House, was the period of the Great Irish Famine. Mm -hmm. Major Dennis Mahan inherited Strokestown Park mm -hmm. in 1845. Mm -hmm. The estate had been ran into debt by his predecessor. Mm -hmm. There were many rent strikes. It was the beginning of the Great Irish Famine. Mm -hmm. What was he to do? Well, the first thing that happened was his daughter, Grace Catherine, married Henry Sanford Packenham, relations of the Duke of Wellington. Mm -hmm. The lands went up to 30,000 acres at this time, and the name also changes to Packenham Man. Yeah. The next thing was not so good. He brought in John Ross Mann mm -hmm. as an agent or as an advisor on the estate. The document is here in the museum. John Ross Mahan came in, looked at the estate. He realised that, well, there were a little over 11,000 people tenants on this estate at this time. He looked at it and his, his findings were, he went back to Dennis and he said, look, there are too many people on this estate. They're not paying rent. They will never be in a position to pay rent. And he also implied that there might be a lot of troublemakers amongst these tenants on the estate. And he advises them that he really needs to start getting these people off the land. I think the words he used, emigration on an extensive scale is the principal feature of my plan. In May of 1847, the bailiff at Strokestown Park, John Robinson, escorted a party of 1,490 tenants from Strokestown to Dublin, mainly along the path of the Royal Canal, which is a six or seven day walk. They um, traveled to Dublin, and then from Dublin, they embarked on steamers to Liverpool in fairly atrocious conditions in conditions really usually used for transporting livestock. Traveling on the deck of a steamer for you know, up to 24 hours, exposed to the, uh, exposed to the weather, exposed to uh, terrible conditions on the Irish Sea. 
On the journey to Liverpool, conditions on board for the poorest passengers were extremely harsh. They were often exposed on the open deck, frequently in freezing conditions. It was reported that if there were no horses on board, they were allowed to occupy the stables, but if there are horses, people are put out. On most vessels, there was no shelter on deck, even during storm conditions in winter. Every article of clothing being soaked through, and in that condition, they were exposed on deck all night. Many died en route. These tenants, when they got to Liverpool, they were holed up really in basements in the docks for three to four days. They were exposed to cholera, typhus, disease. It, it, was, pre it was prevalent throughout at this time. I, I often wonder about them there, and I, I, I genuinely do. I, I, I think, what was it like? What were the, they were thinking, the, the, it was kind of that period where they had just left home, thinking about home what they had lost, thinking of other family members, because some families, the whole family didn't go, three or four went and some stayed at home. Mm -hmm. Thinking of those people back there that they'd left behind, thinking of the fields, the farms, mm -hmm. the small plots of land that they had. And they're sitting there, they didn't know Liverpool. They were sitting, it's a big city, they had come from this little village in County Roscommon and they're on the quays or on the docks in Liverpool. Apparently they were in basement rooms waiting for their ships to bring them the rest of the way. I, I wonder how many people did they meet? Did they meet other people from Liverpool? Were there other people, emigrants, the other emigrants that were waiting to get on ships? Mm -hmm. That whole mixing and gathering. How worried were they? Were they thinking, God, I want to go back? We don't, we, this is a mistake when they were seeing all these big ships coming in, they said, setting sail, coming in and out of Liverpool, were they thinking, I'm not getting on one of those. What will happen to us on those? Were children terrified? Were they comforting their children? Of course they were comforting their children. I think, you know, when you think it was, it was a harrowing, frightening time for these people. Migrants arrived with their life savings in their pockets or sewn into their clothing. They had sold all their possessions and heirlooms. They were mainly from small towns and rural communities where people knew each other and strangers were rare. They were exploited by the notorious Liverpool runners, also commonly known as man catchers. Many were Irish themselves and could therefore more easily pass themselves off as trustworthy. The moment a vessel docked, the runners were on board ship seeking out their victims. Often emigrants arriving in Liverpool in the mid-1840s and 1847 in particular would have to wait quite a while before they could embark upon the ship that they thought they were traveling on. It was cheaper for the agents, for the captains of these ships not to take them on board because they had to provide for them. So often people were left out in the elements to fend for themselves for days or even weeks on end. Often they ended up uh, being cheated by runners, being cheated by uh, a whole industry that sort of thrived on, uh, on uh, tricking vulnerable emigrants, taking what little resources and money they had with them, and then um, leaving them to fend for themselves. The arrival of thousands of destitute families in Liverpool had a devastating impact upon the town. The citizens were shocked and appalled, and officials were overwhelmed. City services were not designed to cope with an emergency on this scale. No support materialised from government, leaving the city to cope unaided. The select vestry, the body responsible for poor law administration, was under no legal obligation to provide relief. Although their provision was meagre, they never considered leaving people to die. By December 1846, over 13,000 persons were receiving handouts of six ounces of bread per day. In 1847, over 5,000 died from typhus and typhoid fever, over 2,000 from dysentery, and hundreds more from smallpox, measles, flu and scarlet fever. The vast majority of victims were Irish. Makeshift hospital accommodation was opened, but as the disease progressed, the medical authorities could not cope. Government permission was sought and granted to open hospital ships, known as lazarettos, on the Mersey where fever patients were now isolated. In 1849, cholera also broke out, with flu and scarlet fever returning to epidemic proportions. 
Social carers and council offices in Liverpool paid a human price. In 1847 alone, 10 Catholic priests, 10 medical practitioners, a missionary minister and several relieving officers died from infectious disease. A memorial to those Catholic clergy stands today at the front of St Patrick's Church, Park Place. We are outside St Patrick's Catholic Church in Liverpool. Uh, it was built in the early 19th century because it was such a large Irish community in this area. Uh, in the grounds of the church, there is a memorial here to those clergymen who died in Liverpool in 1847 in ministering to the Irish migrants who had come over. These uh, clergymen here, uh, all of whom with one exception were English, uh, were ministering to their flock and uh, died from infectious diseases that they contracted at that time, as did uh, other officers uh, working for Liverpool City Council and indeed some of the housekeepers who took care of these clergymen in their parish houses. The events of the 1840s still occupy a significant place in the imagination of Liverpool people. A memorial now stands to commemorate the great hunger, all those who died here and those who settled in the city. This was paid for mainly by public subscription, including hundreds of individual contributions. Uh, it was unveiled here in 1998 by the President of Ireland and fundraising was through uh, local subscriptions uh, and all the local councils on Merseyside and the British and Irish governments contributed towards the cost of putting the memorial in place. The long sea journey from Liverpool was treacherous. The challenges travellers faced are well illustrated in the story of the onward journey of the Strokestown migrants. At the end of May, beginning of June 1847, they embarked on four separate ships from Liverpool to Quebec. These ships were the Virginius, the Naomi, the Aaron's Queen, and the John Munn. And two of these ships, as it turned out, happened to be the worst of what became known as the coffin ships, ships that transported emigrants across the ocean under often very atrocious conditions. One of the reasons these ships were um, so ill-suited to transporting emigrants is that they were often hastily converted lumber ships from Canada, ships that were normally used to transport lumber from places like New Brunswick to the British Isles, were then rapidly converted into passenger vessels to make the return journey and often uh, ill-fitted for this purpose. When this was compounded with the rapid spread of infectious diseases, like typhus in particular, it made them particularly lethal during the summer of 1847. And two of these ships, the Virginius and the Naomi, turned out to be the very worst of the coffin ships. In the case of the Virginius, it has a passenger load of 467 emigrants. 267 of them die, either at sea or at the quarantine stations inland in Quebec. First at a place called Grosseau, now a National Historic Site in Canada, where 6,000 Irish emigrants perish during the summer of 1847, in fever sheds, where they're cared for by uh, Dr. George Douglas and a number of Catholic priests who arrive on the island in rotation. Many emigrants who are not detained at Grosseal because they have no visible signs of illness, no visible symptoms of typhus, travel further downriver uh, to the first major city in uh, British North America or in Canada, which is Montreal, where another 6,000 perish during the summer of 1847 in that city's fever sheds. And then they die in smaller numbers, making their way through British North America in other cities like Kingston and Toronto in Ontario before making their way to the United States. And of all of these ships, the Virginius from Strokestown, from Dennis Mahon's estate, is the very worst. It has the highest mortality rate, followed by the Naomi, the second of these ships from Dennis Mahon's estate, carrying tenants first from Dublin to Liverpool and then on to Canada. Um, as a result of this, as a result of the very high mortality on these, uh, on these emigrant vessels, word comes back to Strokestown about the very atrocious conditions in which people have traveled, the very high death rates, 
And this compounded with continuing evictions on the Strokestown estate after these emigrants have left leads to the assassination of the landlord, Major Dennis Mahan, on November 2nd, 1847, the first of a number of Irish landlords to be assassinated during the, uh, the course of the Great Hunger. Well, reports came back, in particular, uh, about the condition of the Strokestown tenants arriving in on the Virginius. The death toll was over half the people on those ships. That ship alone had died. It had gone out and had apparently gotten lost to sea. It came in much later than expected. I suppose one of the biggest consequences, because of November of that same year, Major Dennis Mahan was returning to his estate after a meeting in Roscommon Town, and just outside of the estate, he was assassinated the first landlord assassinated in Ireland during the famine. And we're here sitting in his library. It's his archive that's in the Famine Museum telling the story of the Great Irish Famine. We've been tracing, trying to trace descendants mm -hmm. and we have found some and they have talked about, um, it was always kept alive in the family, the story. The passed down from generation to generation. I think in particular one family we talk about quite a lot are the Thai family. Mm -hmm. The Thai family went on the Dennis Mahan immigration scheme on the ships. By the time they arrived into Gros Seal, the mum was dead, the baby had died, there was only two children alive, Daniel Thai and Catherine Thai. They were orphaned. There was a priest gathering the orphans, trying to look after them and trying to find home. And this farm family, farmers came along, a man, and he said, look, we, we, we'll take Daniel in. Daniel, well, we need a young lad on the farm. Um, and uh, so they were going to take Daniel. And apparently the story goes, Catherine, his sister, clung onto Daniel's leg because this was the last person she knew. Everyone was gone, this was the last person. And the family said, sure, we'll take the two of them. And the two, Daniel and Catherine, lived on on that farm. Daniel inherited the farm. And that story went on and on and on through that family. Whilst the dead are long since buried, the migrants long since departed, and the wounds largely healed, Liverpool yet carries the memory of the Irish famine. Recalled now in the memorials and plaques around the city, and in the hearts and minds of the thousands of Merseysiders descended from those who arrived in times of famine. <laughs>